kick it off real quick saying that I am using two monitors. Uh, I do have a camera on my laptop here and then my desktop over here. So if you see me going back and forth, it's because I'm looking at two different screens here. Um, but go ahead and get started here. Um, but yes, hello everyone. My name is George Epic. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to share with you all what I've learned about astrophotography so far. It's definitely an exciting opportunity for me to share a bit about what for me is one of the coolest niches of photography that I've come across so far in my 10 plus years of taking pictures. Um, so let me share my screen here and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, before we jump into the fun stuff about astrophotography, I want to give you guys a bit of an introduction about who I am. Um, as I stated a second ago, I've, I've been a photographer for about 13 years now. Uh, I got my start back in 2009 when I bought my first DSLR camera. I've always had a strong interest in astronomy, though. Uh, I actually started my college education majoring in astronomy and astrophysics. So that bug bit me long before I picked up a camera. Um, my grandfather was actually one of the engineers who helped build the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, his son, my uncle, um, also worked for NASA. So it definitely seemed fitting that I jump on that train as well when I was deciding what to go to college for. But by about the second month at Penn State, uh, I quickly realized how much of the current field of astronomy is made up of math and physics. Uh, about that same time is when I discovered that I really hated math and physics. So I knew it was time for a change and I ended up switching majors later that same year. Um, there's a big shot of my face there. Uh, but graduating out of college, I wanted to do something that was outside, that was exciting. And I found a job working on a schooner docked out of Baltimore, Maryland called the Lady Maryland. Um, some of you may, or may have heard of it. Uh, it's a Pungi schooner docked out of that city working for or under the Living Classrooms Foundation. Um, working on that boat, definitely changed my life in so many ways, the most impactful being introducing me to photography. My main purpose on working on, working on the Lady Maryland was a deckhand, uh, so I helped run the ins and outs of the boat as we ran daily educational programs for school groups, and we sailed up and down the Patapsco River into the Chesapeake Bay, learning about the bay, things like that. Um, but in the summer, we spent eight to ten days on individual trips with the same group of kids, and we sailed up and down the East Coast, all the way from Baltimore up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, all summer long. And the main point of that was studying whales and estuaries. Um, and in doing that, I saw so many amazing things on the boat from sharks swimming underneath us. Uh, I was up on the, the mast, greasing the mast, and you look down, see sharks swimming under the boat, uh, seeing humpback whales breach, seeing humpback whales follow our boat. It was a a big sailboat so we didn't make a lot of noise so we'd have whales come right up to us very curious about what we were what we were and go up back and forth underneath the boat so a lot of really amazing things that i was seeing uh, out there on on the boat and i immediately knew that i wanted to share a lot of these things with people and one of the other deckhands at the time had a dslr and was taking some really great pictures so kind of seeing what he was doing on on the boat next to me that's how I knew I was gonna be able to share these experiences and share these cool things that I was seeing with my family and my friends back home. Um, from there, it snowballed into a full-blown goal of mine to become a photographer. And I've been trying my hand at all sorts of photography ever since. Um, I've done macro photography. So taking pictures of small insects, spiders, plants, things like that, getting real up close to things. Um, and doing that kind of led me to wildlife photography. And that became one of my favorite areas to focus on. So I was able to travel over the country. I've been able to travel over the country uh, looking for cool animals to photograph. And in doing so, discovered all of the jaw dropping landscapes that I can take pictures of. And so I explored that area as well, photographing the mountains of Colorado. Uh, took a trip to England where I was able to photograph Hadrian's Wall that still stands there to this day, the great Roman wall that that marked the, the border of the northernmost, uh, northernmost border of the Roman Empire. Um, so doing a lot of that stuff has, has been a really great experience for me. But in doing all of that, astrophotography wasn't really ever a thought of mine until about uh, six years ago when I kind of stumbled on it out on a work trip. Um, I didn't really get into it in earnest uh, until about three years ago, like Bronwyn had mentioned. But uh, my first real experience, my first real 
dip in the water it was about six years ago on that work trip I had out to Colorado. Um, being my first time in the Rocky Mountains, uh, it was really an exciting trip for me. I had seen plenty of mountains up to that point, but never anything like the Rockies. Uh, so I was really excited to take my camera and see what I could photograph out there. Um, I made a point to stay a few extra days after I was done with work so I could do some traveling away from Colorado Springs where that office was located. I had no idea at the time that the Rocky Mountain National Park was just a few hours away. So when I figured that out, I immediately made plans to take a day trip to go see it. Um, I spent all day up there photographing the mountains, photographing the wildlife of the park, uh, each step of the way, just being amazed at what I was seeing uh, around the corner. So amazing trip. But before I knew it, hours and hours had passed and the sun was going down. The main road through the park, though, is it's pretty well-traveled. Um, it's a pretty large park, but the, the main road, there's a lot of people going on it. So I wasn't really worried about getting lost or anything, um, but with the sun going down, concerned about whether or not the park was closing. So I came upon a ranger. He told me the park was going to be open all night, and he actually recommended that I stick around um, if I was able to, to kind of see the stars as the sun went down. So I decided to do just that. Uh, I parked the rental car that I was in at a small parking lot at the top of one of the mountains and I just waited. Uh, after an hour or so, I got out of the car and was smacked in the face by the Milky Way. To this day, one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. Uh, just like my experiences on the boat knew, I, on the boat, I knew that I needed to, to capture that moment somehow so I could share it with people because it was so amazing. So I pulled out the camera and I started shooting without really knowing exactly what I needed to do to capture it. I was just trying different things here and there, wasn't having really any luck at first and probably spent the better part of an hour fiddling with the settings, creating makeshift tripods. I didn't have a tripod at the time, so I had to find a way to get my camera stable. So I was taking rocks, building rocks, putting my camera on it, taking sweatshirts that I was wearing, trying to use that to um, put my camera in the right spot. Um, but nothing was really working and so I kind of decided to take a look at the shutter speed of things and kept it open for about 30 seconds, I think. Um, and a lot of DSLRs have a little LCD screen on the back so you can kind of get a preview of what the image was. And after that shot, after I messed with the shutter speed, I was able to see the Milky Way. Uh, it was blurry, it wasn't professional, it wasn't anything great, but it was the Milky Way. And I just had this amazing feeling that I had done it. Um, it wasn't pretty, but it was the Milky Way and I was able to do it. So I actually have the photo here. So this was the very first shot that I really took of the Milky Way. Um, pretty blurry, but you can clearly see it. And that was a pretty good approximation of what I was able to see with my own eyes at the top of the mountain there. So. I was laughing uncontrollably because of how happy I was about what I had just captured and then starting doing a happy dance on top of the mountain. I think it was about 13,000 feet. So I'm just up there dancing in the middle of the night, all everything, a few people around me, but no one could see it was so dark. Um, but I ended up spending another two hours in the park after that. And I think I was there till about 1 a.m. trying to take more pictures, but not really quite figuring it out. Um, so here's another one I took, pretty blurry. You can see a lot of the, stars are elongated a bit, uh, not very focused, but this one, I aimed it in the general direction of what I thought was the Andromeda galaxy. You can see it right there in the center of the picture. So again, seeing that, I was completely blown away by what I, what I was able to actually see. And another one, very blurry, not really sure what the focus was going on there, but all the stars there just blew me away. Um, so needless to say, I was hooked from that point on um, and I've been, I was dabbling in it uh, here and there for those first three years, but until about three years ago, um, did I really start to make an earnest attempt to learn more about the, the topic. Um, but by no means am I an expert in astrophotography. I'm still learning a lot of new things. I'm sure some of you probably know things that I don't at this point. Um, so I'm still learning a lot, but I'm making even more mistakes still. And I think that's part of the learning process. But I am really excited to share with everyone what I've been able to soak up so far, and hopefully I'll be able to teach you guys something about how to get started in this incredibly exciting field and give you one of those jaw-dropping moments that I had on that mountain in Colorado. So let's jump right into it. Um, astrophotography. So let's talk a little bit first about 
astrophot astrophotography and what people might think of it. Um, when you hear the term astrophotography, some people might think of pictures that NASA has taken with the Hubble Space Telescope or the brand new James Webb Telescope that's shooting out a lot of really great pictures these days. Um, they might see professional photographers share pictures of the Milky Way shining brightly over a range of mountains or a galaxy that we're able to capture with thousands of dollars worth of equipment, uh, telescopes, mounts, dedicated astro astronomy cameras, filters, things like that. Um, and while all those are considered astrophotography, they may give off a sense of to, to newcomers of complication of technical expertise, fancy equipment. Um, it can be pretty daunting. Um, and while some of those pictures that you see require a lot of those things, getting started in the area doesn't have to be. Um, so let's talk first a little bit about some of the types of astrophotography here. So the first one we have, which I think is the easiest or one of the easier errors to jump into, which a few people have shared some pictures you've taken in the chat already, um, would be lunar astrophotography. Um, the word lunar directly referencing the moon. And that's gonna be our main focus here is taking pictures of the moon. Um, this is one of the easier areas to jump into simply because the moon is pretty hard to miss when it's up in the night sky. It's also relatively large, easy to focus on. So it's one of my favorite things to photograph. Uh, one, because I just love the moon, uh, but two, because it's, it's pretty easy to start taking pictures of it and trying new methods of getting better and better images of it. Um, I, like a lot of people, started using the camera on my phone to take pictures of the moon. And then I used a telescope to get a closer view of it. Uh, I think, Tina, you had shared one where you did just that for the eclipse there. Um, and they make attachments now for telescopes where you can just put your phone directly in the attachment and it will put itself up to the eyepiece and you can take pictures with your phone of what the telescope is seeing. Um, so pretty cool equipment that you can get on to, to use your phone there. And But I've taken a lot of pictures with my DSLR um, and a simple kit lens. So You'll hear the term kit lens or a DSLR kit a couple of times uh, to this evening. Um, when I talk about kit lenses, <clears throat> when you're buying DSLRs, a lot of beginner models come in a kit. So you get the body of the camera, but it also comes with a lens. <clears throat> and some of these lenses we call kit lenses because they are kind of introductory beginner lenses, um, kind of a jack of all trades almost. There's definitely a lot of, of better lenses you can get, but it's a good place to start with those lenses that come with those, those kits. Um, so when you hear the, the term kit lens, just think of it as kind of that beginner lens that comes with those, those bundles that you might get. Um, but a lot of those pictures that I've taken of the moon have been taken with simple kit lenses like the ones you see here. Um, <clears throat> and it's an easy target, one that I find myself going back to again and again. It's a, it's a super easy target to start with but it also can get as complicated and in depth as you want it to get. Um, so definitely a really good target that I think is one to uh, a good place to start. Uh, next up is nightscape or wide field astrophotography. This one can get a tad more complex, but still pretty easy to get started on with the right equipment. Here, we don't necessarily have a defined target per se, <clears throat> um, as our intent is to capture large swath of the night sky, the, the kind of shot that my laugh at the sky shot in Colorado was. Um, while it can be a bit more complicated than finding the moon and taking pictures of it, it's still an area that I think can be quite easy to step into and you can get some pretty amazing results right off the bat. Um, but we'll talk about this one in a few minutes here. But <clears throat> now we start to get into a little bit more of the complicated areas of astrophotography. So I won't spend too much time right now this evening on these topics today because they can get a bit more technical. And I do recommend starting in one of the easier areas first to kind of get your feet wet. Um, so first in these two topics, we have planetary astrophotography. Pretty self-explanatory in that your main focus here is shooting the planets. It's a really awesome thing to look through a telescope and see a planet that is not our own. Um, and see it with your own eyes. It's even better when you can take a picture of it. So uh, getting into this area can require some pretty serious magnification. The planets can be pretty bright in the sky, but they're very tiny. Um, so you need some, some good magnification to get a good view of it that a kit lens or a camera phone simply can't achieve. Um, but with the right resources, you can probably find someone who's got a telescope set up already for you to look through and maybe even try to snap something with your phone. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well. Uh, and finally, we have deep sky astrophotography. Um, our targets here tend to be very dim objects 
that you can't see with the naked eye, things such as galaxies and nebula. This is an area that I'm still learning about and still getting better at. It's not the easiest to jump into by any means because it does require some pretty specific equipment to get right. And that equipment can get a bit pricey for those just starting out. Um, if you find yourself taking pictures and you're finding yourself liking astrophotography and want to keep going down this road, then by all means, I'd really encourage you to look into this area more as it can be pretty rewarding and it can, can give you some very amazing images. Um, so, but again, I, I don't necessarily think it's the best place to start. It can get pretty technical and overwhelming um, if that's where you want to jump into right away. But let's take a look at how to actually get started. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the basics, um, including equipment. Um, so I mentioned the lunar astrophotography being one of the easier areas to get started in because the equipment doesn't have to be crazy expensive. Um, while having a camera like a DSLR definitely opens up a lot of doors, you can get pretty creative with what you do with a camera phone. Uh, one of the first things I'd recommend that everyone do is look for a local astronomy club near you where you can learn more about the field of astronomy, but also potentially get access to various types of telescopes to use. Um, many astronomy clubs set up things called star parties where a bunch of members show up to a location, set up their own personal telescopes for other club, club members to look through and use. Uh, I think this is a great way to meet like-minded people, um, but also get a feel for what kinds of scopes there are out there. Um, there's so many different kinds of telescopes that are out there. Um, so I think getting some firsthand experience of, of what, is, what is out there is, is gonna be a really good experience for everybody. Um, but just losing those telescopes and putting your phone up to the eyepiece and seeing what you can capture, I think is a really great way to dip your toes in the water too. Um, so again, I think astronomy clubs are huge, uh, a great way to get started. Um, <clears throat> I myself am part of the Astronomical Club of Lancaster. I can't remember the name of it, but it's for Lancaster County in Pennsylvania that I'm a part of. Um, and some clubs like this one actually have their own observatories where they have some pretty high grade telescopes that you can use. Uh, I think the Hartford County one has an observatory as well in Maryland. Um, so look around, see what's out there and what could be around you that might be a good place to start. Um, I think you'll find a lot of good resources, a lot of good people to get some knowledge from. Um, so looking at just quick examples of some things I've taken with my phone. Uh, I've got three examples here. These, these were all taken through a telescope. So I just simply put my phone up to the telescope eyepiece and took a picture to see what I could get. The top left one here is Jupiter. You can't quite make out the details. Um, camera phones can be a little bit tricky when it comes to details for planets, but you can actually see the planet itself looking through the eyepiece of the telescope. But in this picture, you can see actually four of the moons that are orbiting Jupiter as well. Um, bottom left is a close-up of the moon. So this picture, again, was taken through a telescope. And you can see a lot of the contrast with the shadow of sunlight hitting the moon. Uh, so a pretty cool view there. And then on the right, we have a view of the Orion Nebula. So the Orion Nebula is actually one of the brighter objects, one of the brighter nebula in the sky that you can see with your naked eye in a, a pretty dark sight. Um, so looking at it through a telescope, you are actually able to make out some of those gas clouds. And again, this was taken with my phone. Um, not the best quality, a lot of blurriness, but you can capture this stuff. You can actually capture these things that you can't see with your naked eye necessarily through a telescope with a simple phone. Um, so definitely some creative options that you can do there and definitely encourage you guys to take a look at that. But um, going back to the equipment piece here, that being said, if you do have access to a DSLR camera, then I'd highly suggest using that as the manual settings that you have control over on that type of camera will definitely open a whole lot of doors for you. Um, if you don't have one, uh, you can definitely get your hands on a new kit. Uh, again, the kits that you have with the body and it comes with the lens. Um, they it can, I think they're about four to $500, so not necessarily super cheap, but don't be afraid to peruse places like Facebook Marketplace and eBay. There's always a lot of people selling older models that will work perfectly well. Um, you don't have to have the newest camera when you're jumping in. You don't have to have the brand new equipment. Uh, getting started and learning about DSLRs, I think is an important step as well. But if you're going on the used uh, path and you're using Facebook Marketplace, eBay, things like that, always use caution. Um, there's always gonna be people out there looking to take advantage of potential buyers. So 
just be careful when you're doing that. Um, but definitely take a look at DSLRs. I think that's definitely going to open a whole lot of doors when it comes to astrophotography. Uh, tripods. So this one is pretty important as when we're taking pictures of the night sky, we we'll want to keep our camera on our targets as long as we can to capture as much light as possible. <clears throat> this requires a steady base and tripods are an easy solution here. Um, so a good steady trio of metal legs to hold your camera still is going to be very useful. But as I mentioned earlier in my Colorado moment, you can also get pretty creative here. Try to use things to help balance your camera if needed. The advantage of a tripod, though, is that you can easily move your camera without having to rearrange a pile of rocks or sweatshirts to aim the camera you want it to go. But it can be done. I have done it. Um, <clears throat> an optional piece of equipment that I have on here is a remote shutter release. Uh, this is something you can see here in the picture along with the DSLR camera. It's a little handheld remote here. Um, but that uh, piece of equipment there is basically something that allows you to control the shutter of the camera without actually touching the camera. Um, similar to the need for a tripod, we want to keep the camera as still as possible or else we'll be at risk for some blurry pictures. Even the slightest push on the camera itself when hitting the shutter button can create enough shake to blur an image. Um, but again, there are ways around this as most DSLRs have a shutter delay options. Uh, essentially, you set the camera to a shutter delay and you tell the camera not to open the shutter for two seconds until after you hit the button. So you get to hit it and then two seconds later, it will actually uh, open the shutter. And a lot of cameras, a lot of DSLRs have two second options and I believe they also have 10 second delay options. Um, but remote shutter releases give you a bit more flexibility, make things a bit easier for you. Um, and they're relatively cheap. Uh, the one I have is a pretty basic model. I think I got it for about 20 bucks on Amazon. So I think it's a, a pretty good investment um, once getting into DSLRs and stuff. And then finally, I have a flashlight on here um, that's going to be one of your most handy pieces of equipment. Uh, I think you'll be very glad that you have it or else you'll be stumbling around at night trying to figure out what buttons to push, uh, where you left that lens cover in the middle of the grass somewhere. Um, so definitely a flashlight, but I would recommend a, a flashlight with a red light option. Red light doesn't impact our night vision as much and allows you to maintain a decent visual on the night sky without having to readjust to the dark. Um, so if you go to places like dark sky sites, if you join an astronomy club, they have a star party, you'll see a lot of people with headlamps that have the red lights on them. Um, it doesn't affect your, your night vision nearly as much. Um, so definitely would encourage you to look into a red light option for a flashlight. Um, a lot of them have your regular flashlight option, but then you have a separate setting for red lights. Um, but let's talk a little bit out now that we're talking about gear, let's talk a little bit about preparation uh, for the shot that you're trying to take. So while you can shoot a lot from your backyard, which I have done, I've shot a whole lot of things from my backyard, you will get the best results where there isn't a whole lot of light pollution. Uh, city lights tend to blow out the sky and make things harder to see. Um, before a lot of people jumped on, Bronwyn and I were talking about where I had lived before I, where I am now. So right now I'm, we're up in Pennsylvania and the skies are a lot darker. Uh, we used to live in Bel Air, which has got a lot of city lights and the difference in how many things you can see is incredible. So uh, going to a place away from city lights is definitely a strong recommendation. Um, and then check out various national parks, state parks that might be open at night. Um, look up various dark sky sites that may be around you. Uh, dark sky sites can be determined by looking at something called the Bortle scale. And the, that's a scale that ranges from one to eight, where one is considered a true dark sky site and eight is pretty much smack in the middle of the city. Um, so you can look up Bortle zones uh, online to see what zone you're currently in. And it also can help you determine whether or not there are some darker areas around you as well. So Bortle zones is a, a good thing to remember if you want to kind of look at different areas that might be around you that could be darker and better to take shots with. Um, and you also want to identify what you're trying to shoot. This is an important piece because you might have an idea of shooting a certain target that is best viewed in February. Um, you don't want to be looking for that when it gets dark in the middle of August, because you'll be looking all night and you won't find it. So keep in mind the earth is rotating around the sun. We're not gonna be seeing the same things all throughout the year. So depending upon what you wanna shoot, there might be a specific time of the year that you might need to aim your shot to be. Um, 
what's the weather going to be like? You won't be able to take pictures of the stars if there are a bunch of clouds in the way. Uh, so that's definitely a big thing is to, to keep an eye on the weather. Um, and also we talked about lunar photography, know when the moon's going to be there. So if you're trying to take a picture of a deep sky object and it's a full moon, the full moon's going to really brighten up that sky and make it a little bit difficult as well. So if you're looking for something like that or even a shot of the Milky Way, try to focus on areas where it's a new moon and you don't have a full moon really blowing out your shots. Um, there are some, some apps on the phone, on your phone, that can be really helpful for this. I currently use two of them. I use one called Stellarium and another called Clear Outside. Uh, Stellarium is an app that helps you uh, see the night sky at uh, certain hours of the night. It's kind of like a, a planetarium on your phone almost. So that can help you kind of plan when your target's going to be best visible. You can kind of change the hours and kind of see what the sky is going to look like at certain times of the night. Clear Outside. That's an app um, that I have the icon here for. Um, that is an app that tracks cloud cover on an hourly basis specific to your location. So even if it's partly cloudy, um, you might think to yourself, oh, there's clouds outside. I can't do anything about it. But Clear Outside has helped me several times identify that there's going to be some breaks in the cloud. Uh, there might be a couple hours between 10 p.m. and 12 a.m. where there's some good open sky. So using that app has really helped me kind of plan some things out as well. Um, so preparation is key. There's definitely some things you want to think about before taking shots uh, to give you the best chance of success. So now that we've talked a little bit about equipment and preparation, let's talk about the camera itself and what settings we'll need to adjust at the basic level in order to capture something really cool. Um, main focus here is going to be on DSLR cameras, but I think a lot of modern phones, especially some of the newer phones, will have a lot of these settings built in. I think they have things called like pro mode, stuff like that. So definitely take a look at stuff like that if you're using a phone. Um, you can probably use and change some of these settings that we're about to talk about here in a minute as well. Um, they're not specific just to DSLRs. But um, the first thing that we'll wanna do is set the camera to manual mode. So manual mode is gonna give you complete control all, over all of the settings on your camera. Um, the three main settings that I wanna focus on today are gonna to be the ones that are part of the exposure triangle, aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Um, unfortunately, there isn't going to be one right answer for any of these three settings as they're going to be working together to kind of create the best image of whatever specific target you're shooting and what conditions you're shooting in. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about each of these specific settings, what they mean, and then what we're going to be looking for. Um, but again, there isn't going to be any right answer. So you're going to have to play around with this stuff a little bit to kind of figure out where that speed, sweet spot is for each of these things. So let's start with uh, aperture. Aperture, when we talk about this, we're talking about the size of the opening in a given lens. Lenses come with different aperture ranges, meaning they can open wide or close down to a tiny hole in the lens. Um, it's shown as an F ratio. So you can see in the image here, you have different pictures of the lenses here um, with the lenses, lenses being wide open, very tiny, but you have the F ratio right above all of them. So F ratio could be anything like F2.8, F8.0. Uh, the correlation, to put it simply, is the higher the number, the smaller the opening, and vice versa. Um, in normal photography, aperture can help you create a depth of field in your image. In other words, it can help create a sense of space by blurring or sharpening a background or a foreground. But however, in the case of astrophotography, we aren't really dealing with things like background and foreground as much. And the main goal here is to let in as much light as possible, get as many of those photons of light into your camera as you possibly can. So we want to open that lens as wide as we can, which means a low number. So a lot of your kit lenses uh, can go as wide as f3.5, um, but many lenses can go wider than that even. Um, so you'll see some f2.0, f1.4, even f1.2, things like that, so they can get really wide. Um, you may find that going too wide can create some issues with the edges of your pictures, but don't worry too much about that right now. I think we'll, we'll keep it simple, but so just for now, think whichever lens that you choose, open it up. Um, and you can always kind of fiddle with that a little bit, but for the 
purposes of astrophotography, you want to collect as much light as possible. So open that thing up. Um, next up is the shutter speed that you choose. This is how long you want your shutter to stay open when shooting an image and will be measured in fractions of a second or complete seconds. Uh, again, looking at uses of normal photography, a longer shutter speed can help you create a sense of motion by blurring your target. Uh, faster speeds can also freeze motion in place. Uh, so if you wanna take pictures of like a sporting event, shorter shutter speeds are gonna be able to freeze that motion. Um, but for our purposes, again, we're looking to capture as much light as possible. So we want to keep it open for as long as possible. Um, but the key phrase here for this setting is the term as long as possible because as long as possible does have an upper limit, um, depending upon what you're shooting and what focal length you're shooting at. Um, remember, as the Earth rotates, the sky appears to move around us all throughout the night. So if we keep the shutter open too long, then we're going to start to get something called star trailing. Uh, star trailing happens when you've kept the shutter open long enough to capture the actual movement of the sky across your field of view. Um, and then the closer we zoom into a target, the less time we really have before that star trailing becomes evident in our pictures. So a good basic rule that I like to start with uh, is called the 400 rule. And this kind of helps us determine what that maximum shutter speed, what that maximum time we can keep that shutter open will be. Uh, without going into too much detail though about sensor sizes, um, I don't want to confuse you or make it sound too confusing. Most beginner models of DSLRs have something called cropped sensors. Um, so if you're in, a, if you have a beginner model, chances are you're going to have a cropped sensor, and the 400 rule is going to be pretty useful. Um, but if you do have a DSLR and you know that you have a sensor that is a full frame sensor, then you can use the rule of 600, or if you want to be more conservative, the rule of 500. But essentially, the rule is the same. The math works out to the same thing. Um, so for our purposes, we'll talk about 400 as our rule. So what you would do is you take 400 and divide it by the focal length that you are currently using for your shot. Focal length for our purposes today is equating to how zoomed in on your target you are. Um, if you have a static focal length, then your focal length is going to be easily determined. Um, you might have a lens that doesn't have any kind of built-in zoom in it. It's just a 50 millimeter zoom. So you know your focal length is going to be 50 millimeters. If you have a variable focal length or a zoom lens, then make sure you're noting where you are in that range. Um, it could be if you have an 18 to 55, which is usually a pretty common kit lens, you could be somewhere between those two numbers. It could be 30 millimeters that you're, you're shooting at. Um, so keep an eye on where you are in that range. Um, but then divide 400 by your focal length, and that will give you an idea of what your maximum shutter speed should be for the shot you're taking. So as an example, let's say you have an 18 millimeter to 55 millimeter kit lens. Um, you want to zoom out as much as possible. You're trying to get as much as the sky as you can. Um, so your focal length is going to be 18 millimeters. So you're going to take 400 and divide by 18. So that's going to equal approximately 22 seconds. So in that example, the longest you should be keeping your shutter open at 18 millimeters is about 22 seconds. Um, this isn't a perfect rule by any means. I think if you start getting into the astrophotography world, we'll see a lot of people start arguing about the 400 rule or 500 rule or 600 rule. I think it's a good basis to give you an idea where to start. Um, by no means, it's a perfect determination of shutter speed, but it's going to give you a good idea of what your maximum shutter speed should be. So play around in that area and see what your images look like by leaving it open a few seconds less, a few seconds more, see what it looks like. But it should give you a good spot to start. Um, another note about star trailing, though, this can actually be a visually appealing thing if you're able to leave your shutter open long enough to capture significant movement in the stars. Um, I've played around with a bit with this method of keeping extended shutter speeds and have gotten some pretty cool results. Um, so definitely don't take that off the table either. I think it's a pretty cool thing to play around with. Um, but if you want to do that, you might have to change the, the sorry, the um, mode from manual to a, a mode called bulb mode, because I think manual has a, on a lot of cameras, has a maximum of 30 seconds, whereas bulb gives you pretty much as long as you want to keep it open. But um, we won't go too much into that. Again, don't want to get too confusing here. Um, but let's take a, a couple look of a, a couple of examples of shutter speed things. So, this is a shot that was taken in my front yard. Um, nothing crazy. Didn't go far away anywhere. You can see the Milky Way there. Um, this one is a good example of 
uh, that maximum exposure time. So we took it at an aperture of f3.5. We had it 10 millimeters. So we were zoomed out quite a bit and uh, did a maximum of 20 second exposure. So everything looks pretty clear. There's not a lot of star trailing that you can really tell from this picture because we are zoomed out so much. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you're gonna see star trailing. So this is kind of the opposite end of that spectrum. Same, uh, same aperture setting, f3.5 and same millimeter, same focal length, 10 millimeters. But this one, I kept the shutter open for 90 minutes. So you can see the actual movement of the stars across the field of view here. So definitely interesting, but if you're doing, if you wanna get shots of the Milky Way and your shutter is open too long, you'll see not this necessarily, because this is an extreme example where I opened it for 90 minutes, but you'll see some of that elongation of your stars. And that's gonna be what you're trying to avoid. That's gonna be your star trailing. Um, so you wanna have your, pinpoint stars, and, and that's kind of where your maximum shutter speed comes into play. Um, so next up, we have ISO. ISO is the third member of the exposure triangle. Um, ISO stands for International Organization of Standards. It was used to describe sensitivity of classic film before things began transferring over to digital format. Um, that part's not too important for our purposes now. So just for, for now, for our purposes, know that ISO is the setting which determines the sensitivity of your camera's sensor to light. The higher the number, the higher the ISO, the more sensitive to light your sensor becomes. So you might be thinking, okay, well, we want to amp up that ISO then because we want to have it as sensitive to the light as we possibly can, which is true to a point. Um, as with the other settings here, it's, it's true to a point. The higher you go with ISO, the more sensitive to light your sensor becomes, but you also introduce noise. Uh, noise in a, in a photo refers to the graininess of an image. Um, and I have a couple of examples here. You see at the bottom of this slide here, um, when you start on ISO 50 all the way on the left, it's very dark, but it's a very smooth looking picture. The farther you go to the right, the higher ISO you get, it's much brighter, but you can see that graininess in the picture. Um, a couple of examples that I've taken a couple of years ago, people may have remember the uh, Neowise comet that made its way through our solar system. Um, this one was taken at ISO 4000. So this is kind of where I zeroed in on as kind of the right ISO for me. Um, but as I was playing around with it, I was going higher and lower ISOs and I shot an ISO 10,000 picture. And you can see the graininess is kind of starting to incorporate itself into the image and doesn't look too appealing. So you can definitely see the difference between the 4,000 and the 10,000 ISO. So you wanna go as high as you can without introducing um, a whole lot of noise into your picture. It can be a bit of a trial and error, trial and error but um, a lot of modern sensors are getting better and better at being able to increase ISO higher and higher while introducing less noise. So each camera, I know a lot of people in the chat have, have expressed what kind of cameras they're using. Every camera can be a little bit different in this regard. Um, so for the purposes of astrophotography, you'll want to increase your ISO to a point where you feel comfortable with the amount of noise being introduced. So again, play around with it a bit, see what that sweet spot might be for your camera. Um, so those are going to be the big three considerations when you're getting started. Aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. There are more things that you can dive into as you progress further down this road, uh, like white balance, learning about the histogram of your camera. But I think sticking with these three main points of the exposure triangle is a, a really great place to start. Um, like I said earlier, each picture is going to be different in regards to what these settings will be. So try all sorts of things out, see what you're able to get. Uh, just remember that the main goal is to try and capture as much light as possible. It gets pretty dark out at night, so you'll want to as much light gathering power as you can get. Um, so with that, let's take a look at some pictures that I've taken with just my DSLR and what went into each of them to give you an idea of what you can expect with uh, just your camera alone. So this shot here is the best shot that I had gotten um, that night in Colorado. So this was, it wasn't, this wasn't my first shot. This was one of many, but this happened to be uh, one of the clearer ones that night that I had taken. Um, this one, as you can see, 18 millimeters, able to bump the ISO up to 10,000 without creating too much uh, noise in the, the photo itself. Um, and then again, opened up that aperture as wide as I could. The kit lens that I was using um, was the widest could go, was f3.5. Um, 
and I had the shutter open for 19 or 15 seconds in that shot. But definitely some good stars there. Um, and you can see pretty clearly the details of the Milky Way, the dust clouds going up across the sky. So definitely a uh, pretty cool sight there. This is a closer close up of the new wise comet. Um, this was taken again a couple of years ago. So this one is a bit more zoomed in 135 millimeters, but the ISO I had to bring down a bit for this shot. So 3200 was where I felt most comfortable. Um, and then the lens I was using specifically for this shot uh, was was a lens that couldn't open too wide. So the, the most I could get was f 5.6 on this one. Um, and then because I was zoomed in a lot, my shutter speed couldn't be too high. It was six seconds in this one, but you can start to see if you look close enough at the stars, you can see a little bit of elongation in those stars. So six seconds might have been too long for this photo, but still turned out pretty good in my opinion. I think it looks, I was pretty pleased with that one. Um, and then this one, I was just kind of playing around with this one. Uh, this was actually in my backyard. Uh, this is a 50, 50 millimeter lens. This is a static uh, focal length lens that didn't have any zoom capabilities. ISO 3200, um, but this lens itself could open a bit wider. So the maximum I could open this was f 2.0. Um, and I was opening this for 10 seconds. So the shutter was open for 10 seconds. This one, I did not use a tripod at all. I literally just sat my camera on the ground and had it shoot straight up in the sky. I wasn't aiming at anything. I just kind of wanted to see what I could get. Um, so, and I definitely got a good swath of the Milky Way here with some pretty bright stars pronounced in the center of it. You can see the dust clouds within there as well. So pretty cool, um, even though I didn't have a tripod for this one. So pleased with that one as well. Um, and then this final one is a good example of star trailing. So this is my house. Um, this is in my front yard and um, not a uh, didn't have to travel to any specific dark sky site, just had, to, had what I had available. So this one was wide. This is more of a wide angle lens than I had for this one. So 10 millimeters, um, definitely a wide out view. ISO 100, which I'll talk about in a second. So very low ISO. Um, F3.5 opened that lens up as much as I could. But this one, um, I was able to open the shutter for about 1800 seconds. So about a 30 minute shot here. So this is where I was able to really get those star trails that you can see that are rotating around the North Star Polaris right above our house there. Um, in doing so, having that shutter open for so long, you wanna gather as much light as you can, uh, but when you open it that long, you're letting in a whole lot of light over that course of 30 minutes. So you might have to compensate with reducing some other areas. In this case, I compensated by reducing ISO down to 100. If I had ISO up in the thousands, this would be a very blown out picture. Um, so again, trial and error, I probably took a few of these pictures over the course of that week. Um, and this one turned out to be one of the better ones that I had had. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of what you can achieve without a big fancy telescope, uh, filters, mounts, things like that. You can really get a lot of really amazing photos if you keep experimenting with those things and trying new targets. Um, but assuming that you've dipped your toes into the water a bit and are finding that this is something that you really enjoy, I think the next step would likely be looking into some kind of star tracker system to help you take longer pictures and collect more light. Um, these pieces of equipment are going to cost you some money, but if you're into the hobby and think that it's well worth the cost, then I definitely would encourage you to kind of take that route. Um, the purpose of, oh, there's one more picture. Sorry, let me take a step back. So this is a zoomed in picture of the moon, uh, 600 millimeters. So this one is actually using one of my longer lenses, but again, ISO 100 because the moon itself is very bright. Um, so a lot of light coming in, I need to kind of temper that a little bit. Uh, with the lens I was using, I wanted to do F10, didn't want to open it too much again because of the brightness of the moon and then a short shutter speed at 1 80th of a second. And then you can see kind of peeking at the top of the picture here, that is Mars a couple years ago when they were right next to each other. So a nice shot of the moon and Mars. Um, but jumping back to star trackers, sorry about that, um, additional equipment and processing. So trackers, um, I think, are definitely an incredibly useful tool when you're getting into things uh, like deep sky astrophotography. Um, the purpose of these trackers are to counteract the movement of the sky. So the tracker itself kind of rotates against the direction of the Earth's rotation. So essentially creates a view for your camera that doesn't move. Um, the sky is not moving because your camera is moving with it. And it's definitely, again, very useful when you're getting into things like deep sky astrophotography. Uh, 
very useful for Milky Way photography to get a lot more detail. So the things that you'll shoot um, when in deep sky astrophotography and stuff like that are often be very dim. So shooting them for 20 to 30 seconds might not be enough time to really capture those details. So star trackers <clears throat> are definitely a good option if you want to kind of get into that area. Smaller trackers like the one shown here on the bottom are a good place to start in my opinion. They're easily capable of holding a DSLR and a lens and are pretty easy to use and set up. The biggest advantage of these in my opinion are how portable they are and how easy they are to set up. Um, they're more affordable than the bigger ones, which the model here shown um, on the bottom is the Skywatcher Star Adventure. That one runs just under 500 bucks, I believe. Um, so no, no small expense, but definitely worth it in the long run. However, the larger mounts, like the one shown at the top here of this slide, uh, can be much more accurate at tracking objects through the night sky, and they can hold a lot more weight than a smaller tracker can. That's going to be an important thing if you're going to be using telescopes. Um, so it opens up a lot more doors for you when you're wanting to add telescopes to your setup. Uh, I think someone had mentioned that they're using telescopes, attaching their camera to the telescope. You can actually mount that to this tracker where it can hold a lot more weight um, and use that telescope as the lens of your camera, essentially. Uh, the downside to these is that they are expensive um, and they are heavy. So they're not as portable as the smaller ones. The model I have here is the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. Uh, this one can cost upwards of $2,000. So it's not necessarily one that I would recommend diving right into. Um, they're not very portable. They usually are gonna be something that you set up in one specific location. You can definitely take them places. You can take them to different locations, but they're pretty heavy. Um, so there is that as well. So. And then next we have stacking. So stacking is a method used by astrophotographers to help increase the total exposure time on a target without leaving the shutter open for hours at a time. Uh, the idea here is that taking a bunch of pictures of the same target and then stack them on top of one another to increase the total exposure time. For example, say someone wants to take a picture of the Orion Nebula. Um, they might have their shutter open for three minutes, but they'll take a hundred of those photos when they stack those photos on top of each other, they're gonna get a total exposure of 300 minutes. Uh, this method is preferred to leaving it open for 300 minutes because while keeping your shutter open for that long sounds easy enough, it actually can be a pretty good way of adding additional noise to a photograph. So you wanna keep the noise to a minimum. And this is a good way to do that by stacking. Um, it cuts down on the noise dramatically. Another major benefit here is that all of the photographs stacked on top of each other can really pull out hidden details that you may not otherwise see. Uh, definitely a huge benefit when looking at super dim objects in the night sky. Um, there is also a component of processing outside of stacking where you can adjust the various color levels in a photo, adjust contrast, reduce noise, etc. things like that. Um, that goes into a lot of those professional grade pictures that you might see. This is an area that I'm still learning a lot about myself. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that portion yet because I don't feel like I know enough about it at this point. Uh, definitely still learning a lot myself. Uh, and it's probably a class that could be taught completely on its own separate from everything that we covered today. Um, so it's, it's definitely a lot. Um, and I think once, if you're finding yourself getting into astrophotography and really enjoy it, then definitely take a look at some um, resources for for processing astrophotography photos. There's a lot of good resources on YouTube. A lot of stuff I've learned has come from YouTube. So take a look at that staff uh, uh, online. There's a lot of good resources on there. Um, but just know that there are some basic adjustments that you can make in Photoshop, which is a lot of people are familiar with Photoshop. It is a, a paid service, um, but there are some free ones. I think there's one called GIMP, I believe. Uh, and last I checked, I think that was a free program that you can that you can use to edit some photos, to adjust contrast, adjust color levels, things like that. And that can go a long way in pulling out some of those hidden details in your deep sky shots. So if that is something that interests you as you kind of go down this path, definitely take a look at uh, processing of astrophotos. Um, definitely some really good information in there. So let's take a look at a few pictures that I've done using some additional post-processing to include some minor adjustments to light levels, uh, contrast, as well as the use of stacking and tracking mounts. Uh, so first up here is a picture of M101, which is the pinwheel galaxy. Um, this was taken uh, using a telescope where I actually attached my DSLR to a telescope 
at 400 and 480 millimeters. Um, this is a crop photo. You can see a lot of the graininess in it because I cropped it and like really pulled out the galaxy from the rest of the picture there. But um, this was 197 30 second exposures stacked together. So approximately 98 minutes total of uh, exposure time. And I was using uh, the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro, which is the, uh, the big mount, the big fancy one, since I had a telescope on that. Um, so a lot of very dim light here in a galaxy that's very far away, millions of light years away, the light's going to take a long time to get to us. So you're going to need to focus on that for a long time. And this is a good example of the benefit of stacking. Uh, next up, we have a picture of the Milky Way. And this, again, is just from my backyard. Um, this is looking straight up from my backyard, about 22 millimeters, uh, ISO 1600. And I opened the aperture up to f4.5. And this is a total of 180 seconds, uh, so three minutes. But this is one where I was using the small star tracker, the, the star adventure, um, and being able to really focus in on the Milky Way without having that upper limit to my shutter speed. Um, you can see pretty clear, pretty good detail in there. The star is very crisp um, and really good detail in the Milky Way itself with the, the dust clouds and things like that. So, um, and then we have the Andromeda Galaxy. So the Andromeda Galaxy is one of the coolest things that you'll probably ever capture when you're getting started in astrophotography. Uh, it's a pretty big galaxy that's fairly close to our own. Um, it can be seen with the naked eye in pretty dark sky sites, so it, it's a pretty cool target to take a picture of, and it's pretty big too. Um, I'm pretty sure it's as wide as the full moon. Uh, I think I heard that somewhere. Uh, so you don't really have to zoom in a lot to get to see it and, and try to get it with your camera. Um, so this one is zoomed in, this is 250 millimeters, uh, ISO 1600, but this one again, I was using the uh, stacking method. So I took one minute exposures, but I took 60 of them. Um, so for a total of 60 minute total exposure. And this again is using the small star tracker, the small star adventure that I have. Um, so this is just my DSLR and a lens on it. Um, so being able to really focus on that is able to really pull out those details. Um, I think the, the mount in this picture is very useful, but I have seen people take pictures of Andromeda without a mount. Um, when they learn about the idea of stacking, uh, they're able to take pictures of the Andromeda galaxy, but they're moving the camera manually by themselves to kind of take a new picture every time they move it. Um, that has been done. People have done that. I haven't done it myself, but I've seen it done. So you don't need a star tracker to necessarily take a picture like this. It, it might take a little bit more work, but it can be done. Um, so. We'll end on that picture here. So just let me conclude here with telling you all that there is so much more to learn about astrophotography. It's a very in-depth topic, really a lot of information to learn out there. Um, I, for one, plan on continuing down this road to see what kinds of amazing things I can get. Um, and I hope you guys were able to learn a few things about astrophotography and maybe I've been able to give you the itch now to get out there and start shooting the stars. Uh, it's really an exciting area to dive into. So I really encourage you guys to get out there and see what you're able to capture. Um, so that's it for me. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you all. And um, yeah, so Bronwyn, I'm not sure if there is any time for questions yeah. or anything like that. There are, there is time for questions, but let me first by saying thank you so much. I'm itching all over. I can't stop myself. <laughs> I've got to get out there and start taking some pictures. Um, if you can unshare, we'll come back together. I'll put the spotlight on you. And let me find out how I do this. Uh, okay, there we go. Spotlight. If you have any questions um, for George, you can raise your hand and I can call on you to unmute or you can put it into the chat box. There was a couple of questions up in the chat that I wanted to get to. Um, uh, Alan asked early on, could you speak to mirror lockup feature for DSLRs? Mirror lockup feature? I don't think I can. I'm not sure that I'm familiar with that one, unfortunately. Okay, Alan, go ahead and unmute. And... Yeah, so I, I actually experienced the problem with this during the last lunar eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, probably should have set my ISO a little higher, but because it was lower, 
when I took the slightly long exposures and I'm talking like half second to a second, um, when the mirror pops up, it creates a vibration. So I was getting a little blurry, but I know there are some DLSRs that have either an electronic lockup, how they, I don't know how they do it, but I had an old manual Olympus camera where you actually, there was a switch on the camera where you lock the mirror up so that it doesn't vibrate. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. But the new DSLRs, the better ones to have a, a, when you go into the settings, they will have a, a mirror lockup feature. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks, Alan. All right. Rachel, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I think somebody actually asked this in the chat too, but what is the Bortle scale of your backyard? Uh, the Bortle scale of my backyard, um, I believe it's a Bortle scale four. Uh, so we are kind of right smack in the middle of that Bortle scale. So a lot of the pictures that I showed you of what I've taken in my backyard is kind of right in the middle of that Bortle zone. So um, it's not super dark, but it's not super polluted with light from cities and things like that. So you can definitely get a lot of really cool stuff from your backyard if you're away from city lights, but you don't have to be in a super dark sky site. So I believe we're in a, a Bortle Zone 4. I think that um, you have a lot of people who want to come to your backyard based on the picture <laughs> that we saw. I mean, having strangers just drive up and find you. <laughs> Kim asks, could you recommend a telescope and a lens for shooting on cell? A uh, telescope and a lens shooting on what? what was the last part? A cell phone. A cell phone. Um, I think it kind of depends on what you want to shoot. Uh, I think the, the telescopes that you're going to be able to use have a lot of varying functions. Um, you have telescopes that are more wide field telescopes. Uh, they're not going to be zoomed in a lot. Um, they're going to be more for your larger objects like the Andromeda galaxy. There's a lot of nebula out there that are pretty, pretty big in the night sky relative to some of the other objects you might want to take pictures of. So some telescopes um, are going to be made for more wide field things, but then you're going to have telescopes that are meant for a lot of magnification. Um, so looking at a couple of those examples at the very beginning of the presentation of the, the planetary astrophotography, I had a couple pictures of Jupiter and Saturn up there. That was using um, a, a schmidt cassegrain telescope, which has a pretty high magnification on it. I believe it's a little over 2,800 millimeters. Um, so it really depends on what you want to shoot in terms of what kind of telescope you want to get. Uh, so I don't necessarily think there's going to be a one-size-fits-all telescope. Um, and that's kind of where I go back to taking a look at the astronomy clubs around you. There's going to be a lot of people at those star parties that I mentioned. Um, They're going to be setting up their telescopes for pretty much anyone to use. Um, and I think that's a really good way to get a sense of what's out there. What kind of telescopes are out there? What are they used for? What interests you? Uh, if you're finding that you're more interested in looking at planets, then you're going to want one of those bigger telescopes. Uh, if you're more interested in more wide field things, then you're not going to want something that zooms in so much. Um, if I used that big telescope that I have of 2,800 millimeters and I tried to take a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, like the one I shared here, I'd be zooming in so close on it, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, so it kind of depends on what you want to shoot, really. Uh, so I don't think there's a clear answer for that. So definitely take a look at astronomy clubs and see if you can attend some of those star parties. They usually happen all year round. Uh, winter tends to be one of the best times to view. So you'll definitely have some some opportunities to get to use some telescopes if you join up with one of those clubs. That would be my recommendation. And it, it was just so amazing, um, George, just to see what you can capture without a telescope. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was just amazing. Richard asks, have you heard of the old film standard of ISO 100 F11 1125 as the standard daylight exposure? Because the moon is essentially a daylight illuminated object. Uh, I've not heard that, no. Is he able okay. to uh, expand on that anymore? I don't know, Richard, are you still on? Do you wanna say something? Oh, this is this is, this was a test to see how far back you go. I I go I go back sixty years with a father that told me how to mix the chemicals and uh, okay to twirl the canisters and so when I when I go out and put a lens on the moon I 
at least that's what he taught me. And I just wanted to confirm, you're the first guy I've ever talked to that's really good at this stuff. This was an excellent presentation on how yeah. to do night sky photography. That's a, it's a tough thing to get into. All, all, of, your, all yeah. of your ideas and hints are really, really good. But I, I, I go by ISO 100, F11, 125, and then I click things from there uh, to see how good it gets. Gotcha. Nobody uses film cameras anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some more people get into them again. I think it's starting to come back a little bit. So they might start to make a little bit of a comeback here soon. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, just like vinyl. Alan, you have your hand up. So I have lots of questions, but I'll try to limit mine to you and maybe throw out others to people that are on too. But do you know on those star trackers, because I'm from like pre-computerized star tracking, like when you set it up to align it, polar align it, does it then somehow automatically, you know, sort of compensate for any wobbles or things like that? Because that's something that I'm probably of Richard's age where I've only photograph through a telescope and I would use like what they call an off-axis guide star which is looking at a guide star through the main scope and just using remote control on the drive on the telescope to keep that star in the center of a bullseye so yeah. I'm wondering whether the star trackers are doing that automatically and I need to maybe invest during my retirement years into something so that I'm not working that remote control. Although there's something very meditative about trying to keep that dot in the bullseye for 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so the, the smaller ones, like the Star Adventure that I have, which is good for the DSLRs. Um, um, and, and what he's talking about, for anyone that doesn't know, he mentioned polar alignment. Um, things that are important with those trackers is you want to align these mounts with the North Star. If us being in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm not sure if anyone's in the Southern Hemisphere on here, but um, for those in the North Hemisphere, you wanna line it up to the North Star of Polaris because that's gonna be your center of rotation. So that's gonna give your mount the idea of what it needs to rotate around. Uh, so that's just a quick snapshot of polar alignment, but um, the smaller ones don't do that. They don't have any kind of autocorrect or anything like that on them. Um, that I'm aware of, I haven't used it in that capacity too much at this point, but I don't think they do. Uh, and the bigger ones, while they are much more accurate than the smaller ones, uh, a lot of the, the bigger ones you that you see now are, uh, are go-to mounts. So they have an electronic component to them. Um, so in addition to the polar alignment, you need to align it with several stars. So it kind of has a better idea of where it is. So it knows that your polar alignment isn't gonna be perfect, but by zoning in on extra stars, I think it goes up to three for the one I have. You can do extra um, cal calibration on that. Uh, it gets a better idea of where it is. Um, but there's also a component that I have not myself used yet, but I've learned a bit about it. And that is kind of having a, a tracking scope. So if you have a telescope that you're using as your main lens for your, your camera, you're gonna have your little guide scope as well. Um, they make cameras that you plug into the guide scope that you can then plug into the mount and that will automatically run a program to pinpoint to a star and automatically do that tracking for you, like what you're saying. Um, where you said you had to manually do it, the camera will actually look at a star and automatically try to keep it in that center spot the entire time that you're using the mount. So it's out there, the technology exists. Um, I haven't used a polar alignment scope by, at all yet, but uh, they're out there. And I think a lot of the, the really good astrophotographers that you see that are taking some really great, amazing shots of deep sky objects use those polar alignment scopes. So, yes. Thanks, Thanks. and I was gonna ask if anyone out there that's in, in this Zoom, is using any kind of computerized equipment with a telescope. If you are using computerized equipment, put it into the chat and then you can connect that way. Um, yeah, like Tina said she is. Tina, do you want to Tina, do you want to say what you what you're using exactly? Come on, talk up, Tina. He says a Celestron. Uh, Celestron, you hear me now? A yeah. Celestron yeah. 127 SLT is what we're using. It's a computer.
Natina, is that? Uh, yeah, you broke off there. Is, the, is that the camera? I'm not familiar with the SLT. I may have lost her. Can't hear you anymore, Tina. Yeah. I have to look that way up. Um, until, until she comes back, I'm looking at the Star Watcher. I've never seen that before. This is, is this a tracker? The Sky Watcher? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the Star Adventure, is, is that the one you're looking at? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just looked it up on uh, B and H. I can't see yeah. how it's, how is it powered? Um, so that one is battery powered. So I think it's four AA batteries. Um, so oh, really? that one, you, I mean, you can plug it in. I think there are options to plug it into a direct power source. You can like use it all night. Um, but that one uh, can be used without any direct power source. I actually have mine powered with, powered with batteries. The big one that I have, um, that one is hooked up directly to a power source. So I have to plug that in. Um, but you can plug that in. I think a lot of people that go out to like dark sky sites, they bring um, those mobile power banks with them. I think people have seen like those big suitcase looking things that you can store power in and they plug them out right into that and that'll go all night for them, so. Hmm. And it has no optics in it? Uh, oh, it has to have something to. Yeah, so it does have a, a tiny little telescope in the center of the uh, the, uh, the mount there. So the small one that you're looking at, um, that's what you're gonna use to align it to the, the North Star. So there's a little scope in there, um, a bigger one in the bigger mount that uh, we talked about earlier. But yeah, a lot of, all those mounts will have a small little scope so you can kind of look at, look through it and find the, the North Star there. And it, and it obviously, so I'm, I'm trying to see how the camera would be on there. It's not clear how it, the image is getting focused on the uh, the cell phone lens, but I'm but I've only looked at it for two minutes. So. Yeah, I think um, there there it comes with like mount systems, so you might be looking at the main picture. I can't see what you're looking at specifically, but um, the main like gears and stuff that actually make it rotate but it comes with attachments that you can actually attach to the mount and then put your camera on top of it too so it'll help attach it to the mount so it rotates with it well, this is so excellent i could afford that thank you mm -hmm. and um george what do are you putting your pictures on any any site like a Flickr or instagram or do you share yeah. those pictures with uh, I do have a, a Facebook page and an Instagram. Uh, the Facebook page is George Epic Photography, uh, so E P P I G, um, and then Instagram is just at George Epic, no spaces. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, any other questions for George before we call it a night and go out and start taking pictures? There's still a lot of night left in for right. tonight. Right. Everybody's going to run out and start taking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's adding some more detail to a uh, fully computerized telescope. So that one uh, actually moves, the telescope itself moves for her. So it doesn't look like she actually has a separate mount. It's all kind of one system there together. All right, George, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much um, for taking the time. And, and I know that you did, that you created this presentation specifically for us. And we're, we're very happy and we're all smarter and more, more thrilled and, and fired up and itchy. Like you said, we're itchy <laughs> to go out there to, in a good way, to go out there and shoot the sky. Um, so I hope that you're happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please follow um, George on Instagram and Facebook. Um, then you can connect and message that way if you have questions. I, I, I presume that that's available. Um, and uh, take a look at all of the wonderful images and maybe you can share that. I'd love to get Star Party started with the uh, NHSM. So if you're interested in, in doing that, um, please go ahead and email me at bestrong at marylandnature.org. Um, so we'll, we'll be working on that as well. Right now, stay well, stay curious, stay outside, and we'll see you all next week to learn about saw, sawfish, rostrum, sawfish. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.